work. Uh, and he talked about the labor shortage that exists in this country that we all were made acutely aware of last Friday when the jobs report came out. Take a listen and we'll get some reaction. I know there's been a lot of discussion since Friday, since Friday's report, that people are being paid to stay home rather than go to work. Well, we don't see much evidence of that. That is a major factor. We, we don't see that, that — look, it's easy to say the, the line has been, because of the generous unemployment benefits, that it's a major factor in labor shortages. Americans want to work. I'll tell you what, I don't know who his speechwriter is here, perhaps David Litt, but the arithmetic is, uh, is off, to say the least. Uh, Benjamin, we'll start with you. So quickly, during the Great Recession, a little over a decade ago, the Great Depression, you want to go back to the, uh, the 1920s and 30s, there was never, the unemployment rate would go up, but there weren't millions of jobs available like there are right now. Right now, we almost have the exact same number of available jobs in America as we do unemployed. I believe there's 8.2 million unemployed. So the president, just categorically wrong there, isn't he? This is the kind of economic illiteracy we've come to know and love when it comes to Joe Biden's career. It's just it was a little bit less painful for the entire country when he was a senator from Delaware instead of the president of the United States. Uh, it, who are you going to believe, you know, Biden or your lying eyes here? It's a, everyone understands that incentives matter. It's a basic premise when it comes to economic policy. Generally, we've seen in Europe, for example, they've had long term unemployment in any number of countries because it pays to be unemployed rather than take a job. And there are all sorts of other side income right. that you can collect as well to make it more attractive not to be out in the labor force. Uh, and this is a direct consequence of the policies that the Biden administration is talking about. And incidentally, there are also policies that they're looking at that would really eviscerate the workfare policies, which had incentivized people to get off of these roles uh, in decades past as well. So it's really a disaster. And it's more than just economic, incidentally. There are all sorts of other knock-on costs when people aren't working, providing for their families, developing the skills needed, building up their resumes that they can ultimately thrive. And then let's throw in inflation to the mix here, which is going to be a tax on all of us. And it's an economic calamity for the country. Well, that affects everybody. Uh, Alex, nice to see you. I know that you guys have done some reporting on this over at The Washington Times. Uh, it, I, I was surprised. I think everybody in the administration was surprised when that unemployment rate. Now, it didn't go up a lot. It was at 6 percent. It went up to, I believe, 6.1 percent. But it, it's because of these expanded unemployment benefits, these additional $300 a week uh, checks that people are getting if they are unemployed. And look, I've got to be honest. If somebody offered me $18 an hour to go wash dishes, for example, and the government was paying me $15 an hour, you know what? I'd eat the extra $3 an hour and I'd stay on the couch and play Xbox. Yeah, and that's exactly what we heard Republicans um, on Capitol Hill last August talking about when they were putting forward their COVID relief plan. And of course, you know, that did not go through. So also, I think is important to note, you have the left, um, many of which point to the fact that children aren't back at school. That's why they say the unemployment rate is so high that many people can't go back to work because they're stuck at home taking care of their children or overseeing virtual learning. Um, I think all of it is linked. However, it's important to note that many states like Florida and Texas have had students back in the classroom full time since last August when we knew it was safe for kids to be back. So I'm not really sure if um, it, that can be the only the only reason that Democrats point to for, for this for this occurring. Also, I, it, to me, I think it's it's important to note that you have some people touting six percent. That that's great for what we went through last year, but that's still double what it was in January, I believe, of 2020, when President Trump was still in office. And that's one thing he never really got credit for is the way he handled the economy and the unemployment rate. Yeah, it, it's bizarre right now, Rick. So final, final point on this. It's interesting. The Dow seems to be setting records every day. The Nasdaq has continued to set records here in 2021. Uh, but it, it, we're in this weird sort of economic conundrum right now. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, it, it rarely weighs in. They, they do, you know, weigh in from time to time. But they were they were very strong in their messaging over the weekend, um, saying that they want that $300 a week federal jobless supplement uh, to come to an end. And then the, tr uh, the restaurant unions chimed in and agreed with them. And I don't think I, I don't remember a, a moment when we've ever seen that before. Uh, and, and that's the situation we're in right now because they just can't fill jobs. 
When you have a uh, economic environment where there are more jobs uh, that people need and can go out and get, but they're not getting them because they make more money staying at home, then there's no incentive. You know, as Ben said, you got to have motivation. I mean, I go back to 1994 when the big welfare uh, reform act took place. And the yeah. whole basis of that was on the idea that in order to get people off welfare, you have to give them good paying jobs. But if you're going to kind of sustain this lifestyle of paying them more when they don't have a job, then you're not going to win. You're not going to beat the battle. Uh, so I think there's a lot more that can be done by the Biden administration. I think optically uh, and, and kind of mentally, it's discouraging to go from a you know 6.0 uh, to 6.1 job unemployment rate. Yeah. It's discouraging you know economically. And so we're supposed to be on the path of recovery, and that wasn't a good sign. All right, you bring up a great point. You're talking about uh, Newt Gingrich, Bill Clinton, of course. They bipartisan way they negotiated that in Clinton's first term, and that was the that was the way we did things for really the last 25 years. Basically, if you're unemployed, uh, that's that's a challenge. Um, I, I've been there. Uh, I think it, we've all been there at one time or another, and uh, and you, you kind of need some help getting back on your feet as you get things reorganized, but it can't be forever. In Massachusetts, uh, back in the recession, they used to have T-shirts that had 99 on it, and that would be that you, you've collected for more than 99 weeks, and that was, of course, during the last recession. Massachusetts had benefits, one of the best uh, unemployment benefits uh, in, in the country. Some states don't do that. Uh, prepared to sort of try and get the morning anchor on Newsmax. I'd be happy to talk with you about whatever you want to talk about. Obviously, it's not the topic that we have set up for right now. So if you'd like to talk about Saturday Night Live, I will do that with you. But obviously, I'm not going to talk about anything else right now. So you decide right now in this moment on live television. Go ahead. Oh, I mean, it was one of those moments, too, uh, you know, which is a very these happen on live television sometimes. Good morning. Welcome back into Wake Up America. I'm Rob Finnerty. Somebody said, why would you refer to yourself as the morning anchor? Because it would have been more weird if I said because you came on and you tried to get the Rob Finnerty in a weird. <laughs> In the third person, that would have been kind of weird, too. Uh, in today's edition of Woke Up America, if you haven't guessed, uh, we're going to be talking about my, my dear, sweet little David Litt. Uh, he seemed like such a, such a sweet man before the interview yesterday, but let's face it, sometimes lit does happen. And it happened yesterday to the Rob Finnerty. Uh, you might have seen it live or, or, or watched it yesterday. It was, uh, it was on the Internet, a really dynamic interview we had here on the program. Uh, we invited on the great David Litt on the show. Uh, he's a young guy, wrote a book about comedy, but I'll be honest, I didn't really think he was that funny. And you might say, why would we invite somebody on who has uh, left-leaning views, worked for President Obama? Newsmax is not just conservative, all right? We're going to invite people from all different backgrounds on. We try to be fair. We try to be objective and lit. Uh, he's got quite an interesting background, so I thought, great, we'll have him on the show. Uh, he was a former speechwriter for President Obama. The topic yesterday, topic with quotes around it, was Elon Musk's appearance on Saturday Night Live. And just so you know how the business works, by the way, back on camera, uh, we have booking producers here, and they literally never stop working. They're reaching out to guests all the time to try and get people to talk about certain things. Sometimes those would-be guests say yes, sometimes they say no. And look, if a guest goes rogue during an interview and brings up another topic, I'm happy to play ball. In fact, I was actually happy to play ball yesterday. Uh, I knew this guy's political views before he came on the show. I knew his experience working in comedy, so it made some sense for the topic, although I'm I'm not convinced he's that funny. He wasn't that funny yesterday. Um, even though I, it took me a moment to sort of figure out what he was trying to do there, and that's, that's have a moment, get me. Uh, he was trying to call out Newsmax for the left's now famous big lie, and I just tried to be gracious and calm, which is not always easy if you're sitting in the chair, but that's the job. I signed up to do that. So this guy came out, and he threw a Yale haymaker at me. The only problem was, I noticed this with David Litt, there was absolutely no counterpunch. Now, I'm not going to sit there and relitigate the November election with David Litt on live TV on a Monday. Right? Quite frankly, he's got no idea what he's talking about. He wrote speeches for President Obama. That is a very big job. He was only 24 years old when he got that job. But guess what? That job ended a whole long time ago. So I've got no issue at all with gotcha journalism. But when a gotcha journalist comes on the program, you better have something more than that weak tea you brought yesterday. Yesterday, David, Newsmax was lying to viewers. That's what you were trying to convince people that we were doing in the fall. Listen, if you ever want to come back on, you can contact our booker. I can't guarantee anything, but then again, I think yesterday was probably, and this is my thought after a day to think about it, I think yesterday the great David Litt was actually trying out for a job on maybe one of the other networks. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him on MSNBC or CNN at some point soon. So David, good luck to you. And again, thank you for coming on the show. And that's it. And now Rachel. <laughs> what was it like sitting next to me yesterday while up. that was all playing out? 
Rob, you know me. I'm not one for confrontation. It's right. something we've discussed. You and I are very different, and that's what I We're appreciate about you. No, you, you handle confrontation with ease and with grace, and I well, sweat. That, that's nice of you to say. I will say, <laughs> by the way, just now I'm, I'm peeling back another layer just so you know about television. Yesterday I was talking to my executive producer before mm -hmm. the show, and we almost thought that Rachel might be a better fit for the David Litt interview, okay? It's, it's hard to give now, a, you a pregnant handled it, lady a hard time. That's where I was going. You would have handled it with grace and, and, and just because that's the type of person you are. But, Rachel, you, you are seven and a half months pregnant, mm -hmm. and that would have been a really bad look for Lit had he tried to do that with you. So I am glad that, that young David did that with me. Nobody puts baby in a corner. No, you know, Rob? not on my watch. <laughs> All right, moving forward. The actual voting bases and yeah. anything that bridges this chasm between where the establishment is in Washington and where the voters actually are is going to redound to the political benefit of the party and to the benefit of the country. All right, uh, we are, are still trying to figure out exactly what happened with this cyber attack with this, uh, this pipeline, this very important pipeline that runs through parts of 17 states, supplies almost 45 percent of the fuel to the East Coast. Uh, Jen Psaki was talking about uh, Russia's potential role uh, with what happened over the weekend. Take a listen. It's a relationship where, uh, while we feel we want to move toward a more predictable and stable relationship over the long term, uh, we also are going to reserve our option of putting in place consequences if their actions warrant. And uh, that was certainly what Secretary of State Blinken was saying, and that is reflective of also of the president's view uh, that we will continue to defend our national interests, impose costs for Ru the Russian for Russian government actions uh, that seek to harm our sovereignty. Uh, Rick Gates, you were in the Trump White House for quite some time. Uh, the, the administration yesterday said they hope to have the pipeline up and running by the weekend, which is fairly concerning, but we seem to we, we continue to have these. We remember the solar wind cyber attack. Why? Yesterday we had a guest on the show that suggested something that I, I hadn't thought of, but we've got the Air Force. Uh, President Trump brought us the Space Force. Do you think we'll have some sort of cyber force at some point that specifically is designed to address preventing situations like this? It's going to be absolutely needed. We have elements of it. Uh, there are different functions. Look, the U.S. government has largely focused on cyber attacks within the United States. So a lot of our laws apply to uh, things happening in the United States. What we don't have is the ability to reach places like cyber terrorists in Russia. Uh, how do we get them? We can subpoena them. We can levy sanctions against them. But what does that really do in the end? And I think what you're seeing with dark side uh, in the Russian government is while the Biden administration says our intelligence is saying that this may not be direct Russian interference or Russian involvement, dark side is allegedly based in Russia. And from what has been reported, a lot of these cyber you know, uh, terrorists are able to act in their own accord uh, with kind of the knowledge of the Russian government. So they may not be directly involved, but they're certainly aware of it. And this is creating massive problems and is completely destabilizing a number of elements in the United States, whether it's oil, it could be you know, electricity down the road, it could be nuclear at right. some point. So we really need to get a grip on this. That, that's an interesting point, uh, Alex. It seems like these, these you can call them ransomware games, um, these, these cyber war games, they're, they're going after power, fuel, water in some cases. Uh, is, this the new, is this the new warfare? Is this warfare in 2021 now? I think that's what, what you just hit on is what most Americans are concerned about is what could be next, um, of course. And then I think to, to say where I am in Washington, what I think will play out politically is that this only gives more fuel, if you will, to the Democrats and their ammunition to talk about their infrastructure package and what they could do in the cyber arena. I saw, I think it was yesterday, some of the statements out of the White House were pointing that too that this was a private company. Um, so I think you're going to hear a lot more about uh, increased government spending, increased government intervention into the private sector, um, and increased government oversight. All right, I want to uh, show you a, a video. We had one of these last week. The CIA is apparently really dipping into the, uh, the recruiting uh, game. They're trying to attract new people to the, uh, the CIA in Langley, Virginia. Here's their, uh, a, a snippet from their latest video. Take a look. Growing up gay in a small southern town, I was lucky to have a wonderful and accepting family. I always struggled with the idea that I might not be able to discuss my personal life at work. Imagine my surprise when I was taking my oath at CIA and I noticed a rainbow on then-Director Brennan's lanyard. Uh, Benjamin, your thoughts? What's the CIA trying to do here? 
Yeah, and actually, if you go on the YouTube channel of the CIA, there's a bevy of videos like this. One of them was very popular that came out last week, and then there's this one as well. Very important to note the focus on John Brennan in that video in particular, because right. John Brennan has shepherded in the wokeism that now pervades the CIA, just like it unfortunately pervades every element of the federal government at this point. But this is no laughing matter. The CIA exists to steal the secrets of our worst adversaries and protect our crown jewel secrets. And this focus on identity politics and the like, while it's put forth as being you know, inclusive and open and tolerant, really it's imposing a radical political ideology on an intelligence apparatus that has to be insulated from politics. And instead, as we've seen over the last four years plus, it's not just about the identity politics aspect of it, the progressive cultural part of it. Mm. It's also bleeds into the policy and we've seen it used to target domestic political foes. Yeah, and that's a very scary thing for the country when your intelligence apparatus becomes another political weapon. We can we can pick this up uh, on the other side. I, I think you hit the nail on the head, though. I don't the, the video opens in, in that that gentleman that who works for the CIA says, you know, I'm gay and I saw a rainbow on my first day at the CIA. That that's wonderful. I, I don't care. That's wonderful. But I can tell you that this this thing you said, the, the work inclusion, when you go to work, you should be bringing your A game every single day. And a lot of times we leave stuff that's going on at home at home. I know I do it. I do it all the time. I'm sure you guys do it, too. You, you put on a little bit different face when you go to work because it's work. That's why they call it work. You're, you, you want all that stuff is great, but we don't need that necessarily. You leave some stuff at home, and I think for uh, an organization like the CIA, I I'm not sure what the angle is here. Uh, but again, we can pick, in pick this up uh, right after the commercial break. Um, panel, we'll see you in just a minute. Rachel is back with us. She's got to look at what to watch for on this Tuesday. Hey, Thanks, Rachel. Rob. Let's take a look. President Joe Biden is scheduled to meet virtually with surrounding the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, in case you missed it. The group has been under fire for its finances, its lack of diversity, and press conferences filled with sexism, racism, and homophobia. It's never good when you check every box in a human resources video. So, yeah, yeah, we did that too. Yeah, we definitely did that. Meanwhile, Fox News heard all that and was like, we'll host it. Uh, you know what? Heard that joke? Heard it, right? I just think it's, it's a minute late. As is often so so often the case with Jimmy, mm. it's like that that fine a uh, couple minute years yeah. a little bit too late. You know uh, something we were talking about, Rob. It's interesting. A lot of stars were calling for the Globes to readdress their association with the Hollywood Foreign yep. Press Association, but it's the stars that go to these events, and it's the stars that hand each other out the awards. So they're canceling their own party. There's not going to be a Golden Globes next year. Maybe it'll come back in 2023. And as I mentioned earlier in the last half hour, Tom Cruise actually returned all of his Golden Globes. Sent him back. What are you? Where are you with Tom Cruise right now? I, I like him. <laughs> I'll keep that to myself. No, I just like. You, you always know, put me in the hot seat. You know when he freaked out at the? Uh, they were making a film over in Europe, and he freaked out at the cast and crew and didn't know that he was on about, camera. About so, like, the I, we, masks. Yeah, yeah, because they weren't Mission wearing Impossible. masks. And this mm -hmm. is when the film industry was just trying to get out. I mean, we mm -hmm. saw the movies that were nominated for Best Picture, so obviously they, they need to start making movies again. Uh, but he was out there, and he was like, you know, you guys got. He was freaking out, and I was kind of like, yeah, but he's he's speaking for the entire industry here. So like, I kind of applauded him because I was. The whole point, well, let's get people back to work. And, Sometimes, and Rob. With him in that regard. Delivery is important. Yeah, his delivery, I mean, he could have been a little more. <laughs> I mean, maybe a quick run through the human That's resources all I'll say. room. The, yeah, but he did, he did kind of lose it. But we've seen Tom lose it before. We have. Um, Jump on still the excited couch. about Top Gun, too. Is that still happening? It's supposed to. Apparently. We'll see. All right. I've never watched the Golden Globes, by the way. Well, now I, you don't yeah, have to worry yeah. about whether you have to or not next year. Yeah. All right. Um, let's welcome back the powerhouse panel from the Washington Times. Alex Swoyer is with us, senior contributor for the Federalist. Benjamin Weidgarten is here. And former Trump campaign aide Rick Gates is here as well. Panel, I just quickly on that CIA video, we were talking about that, Rick. It, 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 if you go to the, I think it's MI6, is, is that's the British, that's basically the counterpart to the CIA in the UK. Is that accurate? If you, if you go to their website, it's like, it's pretty hardcore, um, and that's you know James Bond was a you know 007 with with MI6. Um, so I'm not sure if if we're going to see a video that that's that woke coming out of there. But what are your thoughts on what the CIA is trying to do here? What are they? When trying did to we do here? start publicly recruiting CIA operatives? I mean, my, my history with the CIA is it's been clandestine. You're not supposed to know. So right. when I saw these videos, I'm thinking that the <laughs> you know Chinese, the Russians, and the North Korean intelligence services are sitting there taking pictures and notes about the uh, potential agents that the CIA might have or uh, will hire. 
And I think, you know, people like John Brennan, if, if, <laughs> if he's going to do this, you know, he needs to think through exactly uh, what implications this has for the national security of the United States. And perhaps John Brennan should be focused more on uh, keeping the information quiet than bungling things like the uh, Russia collusion investigation, uh, which was obviously a debacle. So That's I think point. this is wokeism at its worst, but more importantly, what impact will it have on our national security? That is more dangerous. Well, it ruins some of the allure, too, that I always had about the clandestine nature of what they do at the CIA. I, I, I you know, I remember the movie The Recruit with uh, Al Pacino and Colin Farrell. Of course. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> Al Pacino just watched Scarface recently. I'd never actually seen it. Good movie, like nine hours long. Um, Alex Sawyer, Washington Times, you guys were covering, you guys have sort of been on top of the, the Bill Gates situation. And I'm just going to ask the one question that I think everyone's wondering here. And, and you've got to remember, not you, Alex, but just the general public, that they are both lawyered up, and a good lawyer is going to use anything in he or she's toolbox to try and sort of make sure that their client gets the most money in this situation in a settlement. Is there any indication right now Bill Gates has done anything immoral we know that he flew on Jeffrey Epstein's plane. Anything that has anything to do with Jeffrey Epstein is is bad. But is there any evidence that he's actually done anything immoral? As far as I know and seen, I, no. I think that, of course, anytime Epstein comes up, it becomes guilt by association. Um, and to be honest, I don't think most Americans at this point are surprised when another wealthy uh, male has some sort of ties to Epstein. It looks like he was well connected on both the left and the right. Um, of course, it's interesting to find out. Uh, of course, those of us that like to follow gossip and those types of those yeah. stories um, that his wife, Bill Gates, his wife, was looking into divorce back in 2019 when all of the, these revelations came out. It makes you wonder what she might know or if there's more to be told. But I guess, like everything, we'll find out with time. Well, I, I was watching uh, the, the CBS Morning Show, Benjamin, and they, I saw this, this clip. I wasn't watching it live, but they made a comment, something to the effect of, uh, you see, they've got, they've got problems just like, just like you and I do. And I, I, I felt like I don't have any of the problems that Bill Gates has. <laughs> I, literally not a single one of these uh, problems. Um, but his wife, uh, Melinda, said that, that the, their situation, their marriage is irrevocably broken, which is extremely strong terms. Now, I know divorce, you know, they don't typically end... Um, well, but sometimes they can end amicably. That doesn't seem like the case here. Yeah, and, and I went back and I saw an old profile reference where it talked about uh, Gates's relationships with his his past girlfriends, that he was still very close with them from the very start of the relationship with Melinda. It's all kind of very bizarre. And just to go back to the Epstein thing, it's just amazing how many prominent people are involved with him in one way or another. And it's like everyone has an incentive for the story to go away. Yeah. And I still want to know, how is it that he ended up being so financially successful in the first place? Because it doesn't seem like there was any evidence of him being a financial whiz as an investor. I saw sort of the Occam's razor explanation that this was a guy who basically was extorting or blackmailing all of these prominent people in his inner circle. And that right. explains how we had all of these accounts. I think it'd be fascinating to find out how did how did he make his money? Very basic questions about this story uh, have not yet been answered. And I think it's because so many powerful people have an incentive to bury it and cover it up. It's, it's worth watching the Maxwell trial that's going on. Yeah, his aide, Technofog, uh, Internet Sleuth has been doing some really good work writing up about her, the pendency of her case, and I urge people to check that out if they're interested in pursuing the story. Yeah, you're, we're, I, I agree with you there. So he had sort of this, this guy from, I believe, Oklahoma, who was a billionaire, who kind of knighted him early on in his career and gave him a big portion of his, uh, his position, and, uh, and Epstein managed that. But I, I think, so you bring up a point here. With, so Bill Gates apparently took a flight from New Jersey to, uh, to Palm Beach with Epstein, and Gates had a quote about this. Gates said, quote, I didn't have any business relationship or friendship with him. Uh... <laughs> I mean, that, uh, I mean, that's that, drafted by a lawyer, Bill. 100%. Yeah, there was some kind of relationship. I'm not saying that it was nefarious, but I think what Epstein might have been trying to do here was go after the next big fish. And that would be, you know, land uh, Bill Gates as a client. And that's that's a total assumption. But that would make sense for uh, for somebody like Jeffrey Epstein. All right, let's move on. Speaking of getting people back to work, uh, Joe Biden says, hey, there's not a labor shortage in this country. There's nothing to see here. Take a listen. Anyone collecting unemployment who is offered a suitable job must take the job or lose their unemployment benefits. There are a few COVID-19-related exceptions, 
so the people aren't forced to choose between their basic safety and a paycheck. But otherwise, that's the law. Okay, so it, it, it might be the law technically, Rick Gates, but they are giving people so much money in addition to unemployment benefits that people are making more money in many cases sitting at home on the couch than going out and looking for a job. Uh, and, and that's what we saw with last Friday's unemployment uh, report, isn't it? The report went yeah, up. Biden's statement, yeah, Biden's statement is a reaction to uh, what a lot of people have criticized, Republicans and Democrats, about you make more money by not working uh, under government benefits than if you were, out, go, were able to go out and you know actually work at a job, uh, which exists. And so Biden has had to come back and recover on this because obviously the economic data is disappointing. Uh, everybody anticipated that it would be a million jobs. It was about 266,000. And so this does not lead to the message that there is this massive economic recovery going on, which Biden has both talked about and promised. So I think this is a very weak argument from Biden's point of view, and, and more importantly, how is he going to enforce this? Uh, this idea that, you know, if you don't take a, a well-paying job and you stay on the benefits, you're going to be cut off. Who's going to do that? What are the you know points of that? What are the, you know, the, the, the implications? So I think that was a reaction by Biden to the overall message that you're not on a good path here. You better, you know, get it straight. Yeah. And it makes sense. If you're making more money at home, why, why go back to work? I, I, I don't, blame these people that have been living off the dole. Uh, I, I totally get it. Time to get you caught up on some rapid reactions this morning. It looks like the gold is rusting. NBC announces it will not air the Golden Globes next year, telling the Hollywood Foreign Press Association it needs to rectify its diversity issues. Now, this all comes as the organization agreed to recruit more black members, considering the 86-person group currently has zero black members. NBC issuing this statement saying, quote, we continue to believe that the HFPA is committed to meaningful reform. However, change of this magnitude takes time and work, and we feel strongly that the HFPA needs time to do it right. As such, NBC will not air the 2022 Globes. Assuming the organization executes on its plan, we are hopeful that we'll be in a position to air the show in January of 2023. Now, A-list actors voicing their opinion, Scarlett Johansson wanting Hollywood to step back from the HFPA unless there is, quote, necessary fundamental reform within the organization. Mark Ruffalo simply tweeting, hashtag change is golden. But Tom Cruise taking it an extra step by actually returning the three Golden Globes he won for his roles in Jerry Maguire, Magnolia, and Born on the Fourth of July. Streaming platforms and studios also taking a stand, Netflix being the first to do so. Writer, producer, and director Ava DuVernay tweeting out that this is a big deal, props to Netflix. Showrunner and producer Shonda Rhimes tweeting out something similar, saying, once again, Netflix shows it can be and how it should be done. This is how to be the change. Now, lastly, here's what the Golden Globes has tweeted out as the timeline for the reform. They say new members admitted, a new board elected, a new CEO, CFO, and the resignation of existing board members and officers. That's Rob. a little harsh, the resignation. I, I think that they are, they're, try, they're striving toward meaningful reform mm -hmm. and, and making sure that board of 80 plus members is more diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, that's gonna take more than a minute, but I don't think other people should lose their jobs lose as, their a job result. as a result. Lose their job as a result. expand the board, but I don't know. People are so upset about this. On so the front page of the New York Post, I was like, who, uh, who cares? You're not a big Golden Globes guy. If you're in the world of Is a, anybody a big shows? Golden Globes guy? Is anybody like, I gotta say that? <laughs> Like, I just want to go to the parties when I see it. That's I don't the care interesting about it. part. Yeah. The people that are, are criticizing that, it, I guess, in some way be canceled are the people that go to it. So Those maybe, parties. you know. Not me. Maybe. One day. One day. Um, all right. In the last 24 hours, Israel and Hamas have traded rocket fire, killing dozens and injuring hundreds. The rocket attacks coming from the Gaza Strip into Jerusalem, marking the first time the ancient city has been targeted since 2014. Israel has responded. They did so while you were likely sleeping, striking 130 targets with fighter jets and drones overnight in Gaza. The U.N. Security Council, we are hearing that they have met. They, of course, have not taken any formal action yet. Joining us now for more on what's going on is the former chief of staff, the National Security Council, and former CIA analyst Fred Flights and the former mayor of a city called uh, Shiloh in Israel, David Rubin, back with us uh, this morning, back in Israel. I know you were with us last week uh, here in studio in New York, so I'm glad you got uh, back safely. Good morning to both of you. Um, Fred, I would like to start with you. This all started when police tried to get control of protesters at the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount, very famous mosque. Um, do we know why this all started? Yeah, the reason it started is the Palestinians saw an opportunity. They see Israel's between governments. They see Netanyahu may be on the way out. They see a weak American government under Joe Biden that's trying to appease Iran and is anti-Israel. But the most important reason 
is that the Palestinian Authority wants to again postpone elections and use this violence for cover. There would be protests against the Palestinian Authority, against Abu Mazen, and he's using this to not hold elections, and this whole thing is thus spun out of control. Okay, uh, David, for, for our audience here in the States um, who might, you know, they might know that the situation is not good over there right now. Things got worse yesterday. Uh, the terrorist group Hamas launched at least 45 rockets from Gaza, and Israel then responded with airstrikes overnight. They might have killed up to 20 people. We don't have confirmation on those exact numbers yet. But how bad is the situation right now? Well, the situation is, is certainly heated up. There's, there's no question about it. Uh, and it could be expected. You know, look, look we, we just came out of the corona pandemic uh, in Israel, uh, pretty much finished at this point, and things are going back to normal. Unfortunately, this is part of our normal, uh, that there is Palestinian terrorism on, on Israel. Uh, but the very fact that they were able to hit a couple of sites very close to Jerusalem well, that, that indicates that they, they have been working very hard on their missile capability. And because of that, uh, it's really forbidden for Israel, from, from the way I see it, it is forbidden for Israel to allow them that time to improve their, their missile capabilities. Uh, we need to hit them now, we need to hit them hard, and we need to hit them in a very disproportionate way. That is the key word here, David, disproportionate. David, do they have the technology, you think, to actually hit within the walls of uh, the ancient city if they wanted to? Are they doing this deliberately? Oh, they, they absolutely do. Perhaps they, you know, in terms of hitting their targets, they're a little bit off, but Okay. They definitely have the capability because they hit Mavaseret Sion, yeah. uh, which is a which is a small city, uh, just uh, just north of Jerusalem, That's very scary. very close. Yeah. Um, Fred, this week one of the most important weeks for Palestinians and Israelis. Israel uh, was celebrating Jerusalem Day um, just recently, and that day, you know, this is marks the uh, uh, the end of the 1967 Six Day War. Um, we have probably haven't seen a, a conflict like this in, in quite some time around Jerusalem Day, but uh, 